Very interesting. I'll tell you, I'll ask you this question, if I may. I mean, you're a creative person, that's quite clear to me, but my creativity in the recent years, I mean, the last seven or eight years, far exceeded anything in my previous life. And I think one of the reasons is, in my previous life, it was a condition of absolutely having to earn money, but more importantly, serving others. So it's their agenda, not your agenda. And suddenly when it becomes your agenda, I found in my own experience, your creativity multiplies dramatically. Frank makes a really excellent point because, you know, I've, I've never forgotten the TED Talk by Ken Robinson when he talks about creativity. And I think the topic of the talk is, have schools killed creativity? And it's not just the schools that kill creativity. It's also large organisations that have large amounts of people working in it. And the majority of them have no responsibility for creativity. It's only been assigned to specific individuals that are in the role of creating new things, of doing the product development, of creating new things. Everybody else just goes there to do a job. And so the fact that Frank says that only in the last seven or eight years that he's, you know, discovered that actually he is hugely creative in himself. And I've, I've experienced exactly the same in my life too. So it's a really super interesting interview to hear about Frank's journey in the kind of IT industry in the very early days of the IT industry. And he's still very much at the forefront of everything that is happening. I know you're going to really enjoy this podcast. So enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Frank. How are you today? Good morning, Michael. Very well, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And well, I have to mention Richard, Richard Tubb, who introduced you to me, uh, which I'm really super grateful. And believe it or not, when I started podcasting, uh, I think it was 2015, 2016 when I started and um, Richard was my very first guest um, because he inspired me because he, he does a podcast, of course, on his tub blog and he, I went, oh, I want to get involved with this podcasting. So I asked him lots of questions. I found some course somewhere online that I then studied because I, I really wanted to master the technology and what was involved with it all. So uh, thank you, Richard, for introducing me to Frank. <laughs> yeah, lovely chap. Richard and I, he counts me as a friend, which I'm really pleased about. We met at a CompTIA event many years ago. This is an industry uh, organization in the IT industry. Yes. Uh, sometimes when you meet people, you just have an instant like for them. You have an instant rapport. And that was the case with Richard. And I now follow him, as you say, on his tub blog. It is relevant to my work. Yes. And I, I counsel him from time to time in terms of things that I'm doing. And I need his wise words and uh, insight to uh, his work uh, that um, I then take away and build into my ideas and communicate with those clients I'm working with. So, yes, uh, uh, if you are in the IT industry and if you're a managed service provider and you're listening to this podcast, you should look up Richard Top at Tubblock. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, good advice. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a good friend of mine as well. I definitely call him that. I've known him for years. So, um, OK, Frank, so let's get into you now and l learn a little bit about your journey. So the first question I ask all my guests are, can you tell us a little bit about your personal life? So where were you born? Um, you're about your education. Have you moved around where, where you now live? Uh, just so people get a sense of a little bit of your background, you know, where it all started. And then we'll transition into your first job and, and take it from there. So over very to good. you. Thank you very much. So I was born in St. Helier. That is a hospital, not a not a place, <laughs> uh, which is often associated with Jersey, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, very near Sutton in Surrey. And uh, that was uh, 63 years ago. I'm 64 this year in December. And... I lived in uh, Tadworth in Surrey and uh, with my folks and uh, my father at that time was just transitioning 
out of the Navy into civilian life. He was an engineer specializing in radar. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm telling you this is because he traveled extensively around the world, yes. uh, involved in civil aviation, civil aviation and military uh, projects, which meant that my early life was um, interesting from the point of view at the tender age of seven. I was living in Singapore uh, with a family studying alongside uh, Chinese, Japanese, Australian, New Zealand uh, folk. Mm. And later in, uh, in my childhood years, I uh, the family lived in Penang, again, where I was studying alongside uh, those, uh, again, Chinese, Japanese, Malay, um, Australia, New Zealand. So I had an interesting childhood and education, which wasn't conventional in the sense of going to primary school, secondary school, etc. Yes. An unusual experience that set me aside from many of my fellow students. And at that time, of course, well, going back 50 years here, air travel, particularly to distant places like um, uh, Singapore and Penang, just wasn't known. Most people mm. never travel. So, yes, I had an interesting childhood and education, varied. It made me much more aware at that time than most of my peers about the the world, seeing those different parts of the world, and also mixing with people from different backgrounds and cultures. That's brilliant. So, um, so what age were you when you kind of then left that area, or did that just yeah. continue? Well, I came back into the uh, schooling system here in the UK mm. just as I was entering um, – just beyond the age which you went to secondary school. So I had a conventional education then in terms of studying O levels and A levels. And I've got to tell you, I was not a great student. <laughs> I really I really wasn't that I passed my exams but with a lot of effort. Uh, but I was much more of a sports person than a, an academic and easily distracted from my studies due to my interest in sport, which is a key part of my life. I do keep fit uh, and have a range of activities to keep fit even today. Mm. Perhaps unusual for someone of my age. But, um, yeah, so I was not a great academic. However, the interesting thing, and we'll come to this later, is that whilst I wasn't scholarly at school, I have become scholarly in later life. Yeah, yeah. Join the club. <laughs> Join the club. Yeah, that sounds like me. And um, what? So you did kind of secondary school education then back in the UK. And was that was that a bit of a shock for you after having studied abroad with all the different cultures and nationalities? Yeah, I, I was more advanced in my studies than my peers at that time. Mm. Uh, which was well, I was privately schooled. You see, in uh, Singapore and Penang. Yes. Uh, What's up in the state system here in the UK? So slightly more advanced in terms of my studies, uh, but no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, people were curious. You know, you've lived in these places they haven't even heard of, and you yes. study alongside Chinese people. What are they? Who are they? Japanese people, yes. Malay, Australians, New Zealanders. So it was interesting from that point of view. And of course, I had by that time my complexion had changed. I'm, I wasn't white anymore. I was sort of a, a more of a Mediterranean colour, which I seem to have retained for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's the other interesting thing, of course, when you when you study in these places, you, you, you don't study all day. You go to school early yes. and the sun comes up and you finish early. Then you go down to the swimming club and you spend the rest of the afternoon in the swimming club. So a, a very different uh, school day to that which I had in the UK. Yes. And I, I concur because I, I um, from the age of 13, I was in uh, Suriname in South America for a while because my father was placed there. He, he was not in the in the Navy or anything like that. He worked for the Bank of America and he was posted out there to save a bank that was going bankrupt. And I, I do remember fondly kind of getting into school for, I don't know, seven o'clock in the morning and finishing at 12 and getting home, getting changed and then making my way to the golf club, believe it or oh, not. Oh, okay. Yeah. And... Uh, I learned to play golf there when, as a 13-year-old. Um, I don't really play that much now. I wish, I'd, I wish I had because I was actually quite good as a youngster, <laughs> believe it or not. So, so with your education then um, and not being a good scholar but kind of interested in sport, was sport going to be something that you were going to potentially get more involved with or did that seize at some point? I discovered girls. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. This is always the same. 
same answer. <laughs> and they're really distracting, you know, and lovely to be with. Yeah, so I discovered girls. Well, I continued with my sport. I was a, a very good footballer, I'm mm. told. I was a very good footballer. Um, mm. So, uh, But girls were a big distraction. So uh, when I finished my education, so I studied A-levels. I, I then uh, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, and I went into to work actually and at that time i mean there was plenty of work for everybody it's different today of course yes. um, and I, I had a succession of jobs i hadn't really found myself at all and i stumbled it really was it's opportunistic and i stumbled into the computer industry at a very early uh, time of course wow and yeah I, and I was working uh, shifts and i was working night shifts and i was working sometimes alone which you're not allowed to do today with uh, this type of equipment and i I learned about computers without much training, I have to say. And then, perchance, I went to uh, a large organization called ICL. They're extinct now. I think they're part of Fujitsu. Yes. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they put me through uh, an education program, which included my day release, something I don't know that employees do anymore. And I had a period of time for about two years where I was being educated in uh, computer science, I guess you'd call it today. They didn't call it computer science then. And I learned how to program computers in a language which most people who program computers today won't even know, assembler, and became reasonably proficient at it. I wasn't the best. I could do it, but I wasn't the fastest. And I was working at a data center, um, debugging computer programs, uh, working shifts, had a good life, well paid. And the data center was going to close down. And they said, well, we don't have a job for you here. Look around the company, mm. uh, see what jobs are available. And I fell into a trainee sales job. And that was a turning point in my life and in my career. And I was very fortunate uh, to have that opportunity. And it was just opportunistic again, happen chance. One of those things that came along, I looked at it, I thought, why not? I was still open-minded and inquiring in terms of what I wanted to do with my career. And for me, it's just a pivotal point in what's happened ever since. Wow. And and this was selling what? Well, in those days, gentlemen sold computers. Right. And if, if you turned up at a customer's premises, there would be a car parking space reserved for you. When you went to lunch, you'd go to the same uh, dining room that the executives dined in because there were very, very few of you. There were five companies in the world you could work for at that time. It's all changed, of course. So – Knowledge then was with the the vendors and the people that worked for the vendors. ICL in the case that I'm talking about. So you were you were revered because of your knowledge. Today it's different, of course, because mm. everyone has some level of skill about computers, and companies have teams of people who are highly skilled today. So the relationship and the power balance has changed dramatically. But in those days, yes, we were held in very high regard. So if the if the if the ICL were calling on you, yes, it seemed executives would be available. And just as I said before, they. they They'd set aside a meeting room. You'd be taken to the executive dining room. Car parking space would be made available. Yes, it's all different now. <laughs> but yes, so, <laughs> so th those were those were good days, good days. And I learned my trade under someone else. I was literally carrying the bag of someone else who was much more skilled at this. And I learned how they conducted themselves in meetings. Um, and I just learned from them in terms of uh, their sales skills and their uh, and, and their listening skills and how they basically just approached. Uh, building ideas into something that uh, were important to the customer. And, and uh, yeah, it's, that was, you know, fundamental stuff for me. I mean, very basic learning for me at that time. And at that time, of course, interesting enough, Michael, if you've been in uh, sales, uh, you know that there were so many different ideas about selling methods, selling practices, many courses you could attend, uh, which would supposedly prepare you for, uh, your work as a salesperson. A lot of that has evaporated today and, it's, and, and there's a lot of books you can read and a lot of different methods that you can use. But the, the, you know, the, for me, at least, the essence of selling is being human. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I definitely remember ICL uh, very, very clearly. Uh, I do remember them being taken over at the time as well, which was a massive shock. Um, I was working for a large textile group at the time who were using ICL, you know, equipment and stuff. Um, and I think the computer, yeah, there was there was the computer guy who was in charge. I think you're absolutely right. I'm not talking about the salespeople, but the, there was that 
that air of importance around computing, definitely. There was this whole kind of status around it. And this guy, he wielded a lot of power uh, in the organization, you know, because he was the only one who understood this technology. There wasn't any bo anybody else in the organization who understood computing, uh, apart from, you know, some of the programmers that were working with him. But yeah, fascinating. So, um, what what kind of age were you, Frank? At the well, time I'd, have, you... I'd have been sort of early twenties, right? But earning a ton well, compared to my peers, earning a ton of money, really. Mm. Um, uh, but the computing industry has provided very well for many people, made some people uber rich, of course. of course. And I was doing very well, and I purchased my first home with my brother in, uh, in my early twenties, and uh, you know, that was the start of my adult life really in, yeah. in terms of a job a career a home somewhere to live sharing with my brother yes. uh, then leading to meeting a girl marriage uh, leaving the home that my brother and i had put together and leading an adult life with a, a girl who was then my wife and then one child a son mm. wow amazing okay and then so where did the career take you then well, the interesting thing was, whilst I was at ICL, uh, selling large computers as they were in those days with a big ticket price um, was a long sales cycle, uh, not typically a year, possibly a year and a half. Yes. Uh, an opportunity happened my way, which uh, I don't know why, I don't know, I'm just in the way, I guess. They said, we are, this is ICL, we are going to launch something called WordSkill. I said, What's word skill? Is it a, a word processing system? I said, that sounds interesting. Let me have a look at it. I had a look at it and I thought, this is fascinating because at that time, of course, offices had typewriters. Never mm. seen, well, you may see a typewriter in an office, but it'll be cobwebs on it today. Um, and I thought, this is fascinating. I like this, the idea. So we want someone, they said, to, to uh, become expert in presenting this product to our customers. And you'll be based in Beaumont, in Windsor. I don't know if you know the property. It's uh, ICL owned it for a long time, which is their training center. And we're going to invite customers there. And we, we expect to sell tens of thousands of these. So that was uh, something that happened along. I, I said yes again to that, got involved in that. And indeed, that was the start, really. Yeah, there's a precursor to everything that's happened since in terms of, you know, putting computers on the desk, a word processing system. Uh, customers were wowed by it. At the time, I was selling into the aeronautical industry uh, that have masses of documentation, and they could see the benefits straight away of not using a typewriter and using a, a device that allowed them to rapidly edit uh, text without having to retype it. And you know, we all use a word processing system. We might not think of it as a word processing system. It's just a piece of software on our computer today to help us write our letters and documents. Wow. And and did that, what, what were you involved in doing that and then selling it? Yes, indeed. So people would be wheeled in, you know, almost in a, they'd be in a line outside the door and I'd have one hour to present this uh, word processing system called WordSkill at the time to them. And then the salesperson who was responsible for that customer would take them outside, buy them a cup of coffee and ask for the order. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you had like a relay system on the go there. Yeah, because it was hugely interesting to people because it was something new. But more importantly, as you said before, computers before were behind some black door where you couldn't go in. That's and right. suddenly there was something which you could have on your desk. The persons you worked with could use it and help you get your work done. This was the first, you know, step up in productivity in the office. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating, isn't it? To think back of what, what we went through with all of that. <laughs> Definitely. OK. And then... So this is still with ICL now. So how many right. years have you been with, were you with them? I was about four or five years, something like that. I spent two years in education with them, as I said, and then I went as a junior member of an account team uh, with some responsibility for a quota. And then I said, uh, as I've just said, I went and ran this project with uh, in ICL to sell the word processing system called WordSkill. And whilst I was doing that, the, an, an industry was emerging around word processing systems. And I went to work for a company called WordPlex, which many people will know because it's one of the first Californian, well, there are a lot of the companies out there in California uh, that had built a product for global distribution that 
listed on the London Stock Exchange rather than on NASDAQ or what well, it wouldn't put, be, be on any more senior uh, stock market in the uh, US that listed on the London Stock Exchange. Right. And, and uh, they became super successful. I had a very successful time with them. Uh, and a lot of money because it was a it was a novel product with a huge market opportunity. They were the leading uh, company in that field, and good times. So, so this was a different company outside of ICL. It was a different company outside yeah. of ICL. So basically, I looked outside. And by the way, the word skill product was not the best product on the market, right. <laughs> as I discovered when I when I learned. As you do, you need to understand your competitors. When I started uh, looking at. Uh, alternative solutions to the one which I was presenting at that time, I saw WordPlex was out there and leading the field. So I went and got a job with them. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Because that's quite a, a short time in those days to be with a company four or five years, isn't it? And then... Oh, absolutely. Particularly a company like ICL. I mean, yeah. when, I looked, when I looked up the line at the district manager, regional manager, divisional manager, they'd been there for decades. Yes. Today, a tenure in the, ICE, in, the, in the IT industry, if you're in a job for three years, four years, I mean, you're doing well. I mean, there are some veterans in companies, big companies, but, mm. you know, some companies can start up and fail inside a couple of years. Yes. And then you're off looking for another job. That's right. Yes, it was a short period of time. But at that, you know, at that age, you're looking to acquire experience. And sometimes one of the ways to acquire experience is to go and move around and, and try different things with different companies. Big company, ICL, small company. Um, uh, yeah, so just mix it up. Find out what works for you. I yes. mean, today, today, if I, were, if I were to be given the opportunity to work for a company, would I want to work for a large company or a small company? Hmm. Difficult question. I've seen all companies in all stages of development. You know, I worked for a company called Wang Computers. Some yes. people remember that. 33,000 33, people employed in the world at one time. I saw it and I worked for it in its glory days and it crashed and burned pretty much inside a year. Mm -hmm. I worked for a company called Novell, the leader in um, uh, uh, network operating systems. Uh, was knocked off its perch by Microsoft. You know, big companies aren't necessarily just because they're big, they're never too big to fail, as we know. There's certainly a story about banks there, of course. Um, so you have to be mindful of uh, you know, where you see opportunity. But more importantly, um, what's happening within whatever opportunity you are currently engaged in? Because it, the market is dynamic. Uh, and you need to understand, where do you fit in here? Uh, I like to fit in at companies that are in one or two places, either an early stage of development, I love doing that, or have got stuck and need to rejuvenate themselves, rethink what they're doing and set off in a new direction, oftentimes for survival. Mm. Mm. Okay, so how many jumps from computer company? You mentioned a few there, but how many jumps did you take then from, and, and how did that then manifest itself eventually into you starting on your own? Yeah, well, the interesting thing here is, and I think a lot of people get caught in this, is that as you go through your adult life, you start to build up commitments. You've got a house, you've got a child, you send them to private school. Not everyone did. I sent my son to private school, public school. Uh, you start buying expensive cars, going on expensive holidays. <laughs> and very soon, the wage bill every month gets pretty significant. So um, I stuck in the corporate world because I was good at what I did. I was successful as a salesperson. I was earning a lot of money and enjoyed a good life. Mm. So I, I worked for, I've mentioned some of the companies I worked for, Wayne Computers, Novell, a company called Banyan. Um, and during my dot-com days, I worked for a company called Brokart. So there's a whole range of uh, experiences coming with each of those companies and and you know a lot of success and a lot of money as well, fortunately. Yes. And then you get to a point in time when you think, well, it's getting highly repetitive what I'm doing, actually. And I want to break out of this and, and see what other talents I might have and do something different. So I guess for me, uh, post.com, when Brocat found, as a lot of companies did, um, I took I, the company hadn't found at that time. I actually left the company and took a year off and lived in Brighton, uh, where I had an apartment with my boat in the marina and just basically messed around for a year to, you know, essentially trying to, uh, figure out what I wanted to do. Hey, lovely to have the luxury to mess around for a year, but I could uh, and figure out what I wanted to do next. And you know what? I found it very difficult to break free of the past. Wow. 
because it was so good it was so good and and so then i decided to have a go by myself to become what people are now commonly calling a solopreneur and i thought well what skills do i have quite a lot of skills working for a range of companies you know, the goliaths in the industry companies that have got successful very quickly then failed small companies starting up uh, and i started talking to companies that um, wanted that kind of skill but on a freelance basis and back then one of the things that everyone seemed to be focused on and still focused on today how do we win new business yeah how do we generate leads and of course and we'll talk about this uh, because it's become quite central to my life uh, today in terms of how i counsel companies and the mentoring i do we used to get on the phone you know, and code yes. call yes <laughs> and that's how we used to do it and when i think about it now okay uh, that time you could do it and people were receptive to receiving calls today they're not no. and i remember reading a book called never cold call again mm. and it was always it was always hard work anyway uh, reading a book called never cold call again it woke me up to the fact that probably this was a dead end doing this for companies even though it's reasonably well paid yes. and it really wasn't uh, the other thing i found it wasn't really exploiting my talents although at that time i have to say i was trying to figure out you know what my strongest talent was with a view to exploiting it commercially as a solopreneur. But so I started, this is where I, I went from being uh, in a sort of you know, what I would call an, in, in automatic mode, which you can sometimes get when you're working for a large corporate. There's a mission, there's a, a, a target to be achieved, objective to be achieved, KPIs to be achieved. Yes can become very focused and there's a lovely conversation i had with a lady friend of mine the other day who said who's just actually quit a company and she said you know what i'm no i've lost my creativity as a person i'm just working for a company it's all focused on targets and kpis and objectives and my creativity has just you know, been drained out of me because of that focus so uh, the, i said earlier that uh, I, I i'm much more scholarly in my later life so i started reading a lot more and studying more and gaining qualifications to better understand how i might exploit my talents in 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 the current day world in which i was trying to earn a living yes so i thought the thing to do is to develop a specialism and market that rather than being general purpose what do you want me to do i'll do that for a piece of money so I, I started developing a specialism so i started thinking about what i had learned during my time when i was in the corporate world and what i'd learned was how to build partnerships right and this is core to how a lot of tech companies go to market now, mm. whether you're Microsoft, IBM, even a small business, even mm. the business which I'm currently developing right now, we're looking to partners to help the business scale, more yes. feet on the street, more voices out there for us. So I started to develop a specialism around how do you successfully partner with others as a vendor who's trying to take products and services to market. And that was really a turning point for me in terms of developing the specialism. So I had something marketable, mm. which I knew people wanted. And I had the credibility and references from my work in the corporate sector for over 25 years. Yes. With companies that had gone to market with partners, some of them done it very successfully. Novell was super successful at doing that, for example. To try and figure out exactly what is it that is ingredient and formula to a successful partnership. And I spent a lot of time working in that area myself and with others to understand how you do that. And even today, I would suggest, and I have conversations about this all the time through my work as Deputy Chair of the Cloud Industry Forum, working with our members who are going to market with partners, there's still a lack of understanding as to how you tune that up how you make it work for you and for your partner mm. and the choices and decisions you have to make that are right for you and your partners as well. Mm. And that that was that then the start of starting your own like consultancy business? Yes, it, yes, it was. Yeah. And uh, what I didn't want to do, actually, I, I didn't want it to become a full-time job. And this is actually aspirational for a lot of people who are solopreneurs. Mm. Because they're, they're, they're curious people. They're interesting people, generally, I find. I mean, take, for instance, you know Richard Tubman. We spoke to him at the beginning of this podcast. Mm. Richard Richard doesn't work on Fridays. No. Yeah. So I, I don't quite have that philosophy. I, I work when I choose to work. Um, I don't have a Friday off. I might have a Monday and a Wednesday off. But one of the things I was looking for is a more of a work-life balance, which I know a lot of people are striving for. And I found that being a solopreneur, although, as we'll talk about, as I've come out of solopreneur and more into entrepreneurship, mm. uh, you're, you get very busy and 
you, you are compressed in terms of the availability of time to do all of the things that need doing. So one of the things I learned during my solopreneurship is it's tough out there if you have to go and win the business and deliver it and you're looking for a work-life balance, take some time off, make sure you're earning enough money for whatever standard of living and lifestyle you want, is that I would never go back interesting enough to being a solopreneur i will always work with others that are like-minded uh, and share the same vision values beliefs i just think it's a much more interesting way to find uh, you know a, a happy working life because that's what i have a happy working life now and, and it's just more interesting doing these things with people yes fascinating because you know it it is fascinating and it's also a commitment isn't it working with other people um it kind of you you're held to account more to a degree as well it may be uh, you're right it could be more enjoyable and you're also held to account because you've got to perform for everybody else for the group oh absolutely and the other thing is uh, there's a, an expression none of us is as smart as all of us and I always keep that in mind. I might have a good idea, but if I share that idea with someone, they will help me refine it in a way that I could never do myself. Mm. So the way I work with my business partners, and it's multiple business partners now, is that I'll say I've got an idea. Please have a look at it and tell me, challenge me, challenge me. Tell me if it can be improved. And if it can be improved, no holds barred. Tear it up if you want to. Start over. Uh, but let's cooperate and collaborate in a way that's constructive so we get – to a better place than I could ever get to myself. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, take, take and one of the things I find in business, and you may find this, Michael, from your own experiences, there are some huge egos out there. So if you're mm -hmm. going to be in a partnership with someone, you need to, you know, drop the ego and recognize that you may have gifts and skills, but so do they. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you mentioned when you were saying about working with others, you mentioned the the V word, which is values. And I think that's absolutely vital to know, you know, people's values. They may have, everybody has large egos. We're, we're, we can't help that to a degree. But if we share the same values, that does make it a lot easier to work together. I think it does. And also, we're a world that in business, there's some horrible things going on in the business world, you know, uh, morally and ethically. Uh, you need to partner with people who are moral and ethical as well. I think this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And also people that are authentic as well. A lot of people, and I, I know a lot of people out there who, the big I am, I don't like the big I am, you know. Um, I like authentic people. I've got lots of flaws and I don't mind them being pointed out to me at all, you know. Mm -hmm. It all helps me become a better person. And, and I will constructively challenge other people as well uh, if I think, you know, that they're, you know, they're, they're offbeat, whatever. Um, so, yes, I like to work with people who are down the line. Mm. Okay, so I'm just going to wind back just a tiny little bit, and then I'd like to, you know, dig into all of the different projects that you've got going on. So when you had your year off and you, you, you kind of came to the conclusion that you were going to do this kind of consultancy job, how easy was it to get that up and going? Was it the market were just waiting for you uh, because you came in with a great idea? Or how, how did that all come about? How did you get going and how did the business develop from there? Yeah, that, interestingly enough, the thing I tell uh, other people when I'm mentoring them is you have to think about your network. Uh, and I had paid attention to building my network over a long period of time. I was one of the first 80,000 people to register on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's now one and a half billion, I think. It's a massive number anyway. So I was very early user of LinkedIn. I started I started to understand the importance of network as I use LinkedIn. Today, I think it's used in a way which is quite different to the way in which I thought it would when I first joined. Um, but my network was strong. I knew a lot of people in senior positions uh, in companies. So I went back to them, and they knew I'd taken a year off. And I said, look, I'm back. Here are my ideas. What do you think of them? Would they be useful to you? Can I come in and talk to you and share them with you, try and understand how they would support your business? And that's how it all started out. So I very much relied on my network. So, you know, build your network, be good and kind to people, because just as you'll see them going up, uh, sometimes you'll see them coming down as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. And and th that paid, that, that went well for you, 
develop just going to the network. Yeah, but also I had a successful track record. I wasn't somebody who, you know, duffed out and just decided to uh, take a year off to kind of put my head in my hands and uh, wondered why I'd failed. I was very successful. So people knew that I was successful and and because that was demonstrated through my LinkedIn profile and my network, you know, pe- people know the successful people in the industry. Um, and therefore, they had confidence in me when I came back to them, at least to listen to me. And if I if my ideas were good, then they say, yeah, come in and help us for a while. And these were all short, short term engagements. What I'm doing, I'm sharing knowledge. I'm not wanting the, the full time responsibility of the execution. What I'm trying to do is give uh, organizations a ratchet, you know, step up to do something which they wouldn't do otherwise. But for someone coming in and sharing an idea and showing how that idea could be executed against, you know, or some sort of objective or goal to be achieved. Got it. Got it. OK. And then how did this develop onwards then, Frank? <laughs> well, then, then you get you actually win some very lucrative contracts. I mean, one lucrative contract I, I won was with um, a global business called Avnet, now acquired by Tech Data. Um, and I spent 18 months there revitalizing a program that the company had that was recognized by IDC as you know, groundbreaking in terms of its um, applicability to the work and role of a distributor in the IT supply chain that it just just wasn't working for some reason. I went in and revitalized that. And that was a four day a week uh, engagement. And through that, you know, you suddenly, again, your network is building all the time and uh, distributors are connected to thousands of organizations actually and you get to meet a lot of people doing a lot of presentations presenting new ideas and ways in which they could be more successful as a business and again this is all enhancing and value adding to my reputation in in the sector as somebody who you could turn to if you had a, as an objective in your business growth how do you how do you achieve that because a lot of people talk about you know, we can help you with growth we're rain makers it's a common expression i hear how do you actually do it? It's one thing to say. It's another thing to do it. And often the people have a kind of a, uh, the belief that you can light the fuse, if you will, and seconds later, you know, it all goes off. Actually, business development, uh, growth strategies uh, have a long fuse. Yes. And you have to understand, you know, what actions you need to take to, to once the fuse is lit to get to the point where you're actually seeing the results. Mm. And a lot of people, because they're urgent always, we want results now, you know, just fail to think about the process and the resources and the time that you need to dedicate to this as an activity. There are exceptions, of course. Some some organizations get successful very quickly and a lot to do uh, with timing. Mm. Wow. Okay, so what was next? What, you know, um, all the... I mean, I know you're involved in a lot of different organizations, um, some paid, some probably voluntary. And how did you get involved with some of these? And how do you actually cope with the time management around all of it? Okay. So Pivotal Event 2004, joined a small company in Guildford, 13 persons, uh, legacy software business wasn't doing too well uh so the three of us on the leadership team there sat down thought okay if we don't do something we'll be turning the lights off one day and if you think about 2004 the internet was available yeah there was commercial exploitation of the internet but it wasn't widespread as it is today and we came up with an idea so we were essentially selling software systems to the distribution industry. One characteristic of the distribution industry is their logistics, uh, which is highly paper intensive. And we wanted to create a paperless flow of uh, record of the transactions between counterparties in a supply chain. Yes. So we sat down and thought how we might do that. And the tools we used, because we we're a Microsoft partner at the time, we used Microsoft tools, rudimentary compared to what's available today. And we built the way for counterparties in a supply chain to exchange paperless documents uh, in replacement of paper documents, which not only was fast in terms of, you know, it was instantly communicated, but saved a lot of time because you could do automated matching of documents in the res- respective systems of counterparties. Yeah. So uh, 
we then went back to our customers who had supply chains and started offering this to suppliers in their supply chain, not only to uh, save the supplier cost, but also to save the customer cost, and that customer was also our customer. And good fortune happened when we were invited into a consortium that was led by PA Consulting Group at that time to bid for a project that government were letting called Zanzibar, which is today not known as Zanzibar. It's the e-procurement marketplace of UK government. Right. Um, the consortium won the bid, and uh, within a year of that, the PA Consulting Group acquired that company. What we had learned in the three years between 2004 and 2007 was uh, – something that was rare experience at that time, which was to build a software system as a service now known as SAS. A lot yes. of people know what SAS is, but we didn't SAS was not known then. No. It was just it was just a hosted system. And so coming out of that experience, I had some unique experience in terms of and, and the others on the leadership team in terms of what it takes not only to build a software system like that but also to go to market with you. And with some of the complications of going to market with a system that's new, where there is no known pricing models, how to price it as well. Right. So not uncommon, I'm sure you've heard this story many times, uh, senior people in a small company absorbed by a large company, you know, you're sucked in, they try to find a job for you in the organization, and eventually you're not quite the right fit. So you get the knock on the door, would you come in and have a conversation with us, and then you leave through another door. So that's how it happened. Um, and it's happened to many people, so many people will relate to that. Yes. So then well, what do you do? You go back on the golf course and you start thinking what you're going to do next. So one of the other members of that leadership team were playing golf one day, and he said, I'd like to start a publishing company. I said, right, that's great. Uh, how are you going to do that? And don't you need some people to write for, you know, write books? That's what publishers need. He said, yes, I do. And he kept looking at me. And I thought, you want me to write a book? He said, yes. I said, I have never written a book. I had no, I, I have no idea in my head why I would want to write a book. But thanks for the offer. I'll think about it. Yeah. He carried on playing golf. As you know, and I've mentioned this before to you, I'm an accidental author with uh, eight books published one, two weeks ago. Uh and the the idea I was looking for actually came about as a result of going to a Microsoft uh, meeting in Thames Valley Park. And I'd been to many of these before because we're Microsoft partners, as I mentioned in the business I've just spoken about. And normally you come out of those Microsoft meetings, you're pumped up, you've got a pen, water bottle, other goodies, you're in the car park, high five, chest bumps, you know, the rest of it. This meeting didn't go at all well for Microsoft. And they were presenting at the time the forerunner of what is known as Office 365 today. That product at that time was known as the Business Productivity Online Suite. So I'm in this meeting and people are growling and being unhappy and people are storming out of the slamming doors. And I think, what's going on here? You know, why, why are people so resistant to these new ideas? Yes. And of course, because of the three years experience I had before building this software as a service, not known as software as a service then, I, I understood the complexity of you know, the business model behind uh, selling software in that way. And I realized that the the message which Microsoft was giving just wasn't sitting comfortably and confronted everything that their partners knew about a business model uh, that helped them earn money. So I thought, hmm, there's, uh, something's going on here. Maybe uh, I can share the experience I have uh, and write it down. So oh, yeah. that's what I set about doing. So I, I wrote a book speculatively. Microsoft didn't know about it in terms of thinking of selling, you know, Microsoft business productivity online suite ask the smart questions so the publisher is smart questions they're a bit of a foil to the dummies book the dummies book assume you are a dummy and know nothing yes. whereas the smart question series of books assume you're an intelligent person and you like to work things out for yourself yeah. so we ask you know we give them information and then we ask some questions and those questions inquire of their mind and use the information that we provided and other information they've gathered or knowledge available to them to make up their own mind that's the difference between the two books so i wrote that book and put it out in the market. And then Microsoft changed the name of it to Microsoft Online Services. And because of the work we'd already done, uh, the publisher went back to Microsoft and said, would you like us to uh, write a book it's called Thinking of Selling Microsoft Online Services? They said, that's very interesting. 
yes, we would, because we're struggling with the communication of this to our partner community. So I sat down and wrote that book, and uh, it was a great success, actually. I want to say a great success in 2000 and probably about 2008, I guess. Uh, Microsoft bought 10,000 copies and distributed it at their worldwide partner conference. Mm. And, they, and they also put it into their Microsoft.com partner portal, available for distribution globally. <laughs> so that that was, uh, I don't know if you know this, but a, a business book, a, an author would be quite happy if they sell, sold 10,000 copies of their book. Mm. So I had a one-time order for that. And of course, um, the global distribution of it in the Microsoft portal. So I then cheekily trotted over to Google and put a similar proposition to them. Uh, Microsoft's biggest rival at the time was Google with the, uh, what is now known as G Suite. Yes. Um, and said, I've done this for uh, Microsoft. Would you like me to do it for you? And they surprisingly said yes as well. So I wrote a book for them. And uh, that was also distributed through Google.com partner portal as well so i didn't manage to secure a ten thousand book order out of them but a substantial order nevertheless but not a ten thousand book order out of them right so so suddenly i'd gone from an accidental author with no idea what he was going to write about to writing books under commission by the way these weren't these books were under commission i was paid by microsoft and google to write these books yes for two, two of the biggest brands in the world wow that's brilliant <laughs> and so, job list job list to author yes yeah. <laughs> and and was that so did these books and and the the advice that you gave in there were they like a large business card that got you into other organizations? Oh, absolutely. If, if one of the things there's nothing better for your if you're going to be an independent, a consultant, freelancer, whatever it is, there's nothing that gives you more credibility than to write a book and demonstrate that you are, well, I hate to use the word expert, but maybe no more than others. And when you when you can say, as I was able to say, well, Microsoft commissioned me to write this book, Google commissioned me to write this book, you know, these people don't give commissions to people to write books, you know, willy-nilly. Mm. So suddenly, all of a sudden, you're in a different league to other people because you are seen to be uh, regarded as somebody who is uh, important enough to could you imagine the influence, the extent of the influence that I had with these books in the uh, partner portals of these two companies reaching globally? Yeah. Definitely. Tens of tens, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. So suddenly, yeah, you, you can you can hold your head high and say, yes, I genuinely know these subjects and I have credibility to talk about them. How can I help you? Yeah. 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 Okay. So and that's led you to doing what today? What in essence is it that you not not the full list but what is 80 percent of your role today in terms of helping others okay so i mentor uh young people who are in startup businesses and i'm mentoring one at the moment and i also mentor experienced people who have 30 years experience in business who are starting up businesses and just need a head to talk to us someone a wise head somebody who's been there before mm. so i do that that takes up some of my time by the way that's two-way because i learn from them as well it's not as though i'm sharing my experience with them they're sharing their experience with me which is very helpful so that i do but also i use that to do the other things which i'm interested in and there's two things i'm interested in at the moment one is building a business which is helping Charities and not-for-profits with their governance, which is very topical today. Uh, many people remember the stories about Oxfam and Save the Children and other scandals that have occurred in the charity sector. All of those are rising from poor governance in the sector. Uh, and we are addressing how that can be changed, again, using software techniques, actually, and data analytics. And I also have, uh, I have my son is uh, 37 now. Uh, we also have a father and son project. He's in the leisure industry. He's uh, on the fitness side of the industry. Uh, we've written a book together. Actually, I say we've written. He wrote it. I edited it. <laughs> and I have been working with him extensively, building a, a large number of online assets with him. So a lot of people think of these guys as personal trainers, and they are personal trainers, but they do much more today. They, they're they working increasingly closely with the medical industry who are starting to see exercise as a remedy to many of our modern day illnesses due to our, in some cases, very poor lifestyle choices. Um, 
and we are building a business together with these online assets to uh, for him, of course, to build a business and uh, to help others in that uh, sector understand that the nature of their work is changing as the medical uh, sector and the uh, I call them the fitness sector for want of a better word. The, the, you know, those that um, prescribe exercise and, and, and supervise exercise come together. And what what are those businesses called? Well, uh, he has his own personal website, which is workoutwithfrank.co.uk. We have uh, gpexerciseferral.com, which is a way for a GP sitting in front of a patient who he wants to prescribe exercise for. Today, he has no way to know who that person, if he sends him to a local leisure centre, um, uh, who will receive him. Yes. So you may, you may, for example, and this is my son, so trained to help uh, men with prostate cancer, either in uh, prehabilitation or rehabilitation. A man probably wouldn't be comfortable going to see a 20-year-old girl in the leisure centre mm. about something so personal. So, so giving the GP the way to say, okay, I'm going to send you to this person. They're a man. They're aged 30, let's say. They are qualified to receive men with your condition, and they have other... Uh, qualifications uh, that uh, are relevant to supervising your exercise with a view to helping you be well. That's fascinating as a project. That that sounds amazing. And and is that up and running? And and oh yes, it's all up and running. And the other thing we did because we we saw, and this goes back to something I was mentioning earlier in terms of how do you promote yourself today? Um, you can't ring up everybody. Uh, you know, you can rely on word of mouth, but it's not terribly effective. You need to use the internet to do that. We actually put up a, a website called workoutwith.co.uk, which is trademarked and branded to assist personal trainers to market themselves online because many of them do it very poorly through Facebook, for example, yes. or LinkedIn, which no one gets to LinkedIn to look for a personal trainer, by the way. And trying to find a, a personal trainer on Facebook is very hard. They don't have the search facilities. So we created a, a website with great search facilities. So you could, for example, if you're living in Hertfordshire, find out who in Hertfordshire has these specialist qualifications uh, because you want to achieve as a person in your you know, health and well-being journey these things. So you can kind of put those in as criteria and they'll match you up with somebody who can help you. More than one person, of course, but then you can look through these profiles and decide if you want a man or a woman, what's the experience, what uh, endorsements do they have, and then contact them. Wow, that sounds amazing. Okay, so that's, those are two businesses you mentioned. Yes, the, but the the business which I'm really focused on is interesting. So, uh, uh, some time back, maybe eleven years back, I, I did my first volunteering. Actually, I had volunteered before. I, I drove the community bus actually, which was quite fun. Uh, one day a week as a volunteer service, I became a trustee of the Citizens Advice Bureau in Waverley, now known as Citizens Advice, as my first proper professional volunteering experience. And I sat on the board for three and a half years, and I learned how the role of trustees. By the by the way, so I've had a million trustees in the UK who serve voluntarily and give their time uh, to charities and not-for-profits. And I learned for the first time the role of a trustee in society. And it's a very responsible role, by the way, every bit as responsible as a main board director of Vodafone, actually with the same liabilities potentially as well. And I learned about how charities operate and how they operate in their community and the services they deliver and how that benefits uh, people. Um, that is very relevant today because my major business today is Digiboard Limited, and it goes back to something I said before. Mm. This is about how we are helping the charity and not-for-profit sector improve their governance, and this is really important to them. Public trust and confidence in the charity sector is in decline. What does that mean? People are less inclined to put their hand in their pocket, and the biggest donator to charities are you and I, actually. Absolutely. Govern Government contribute about seventeen billion a year, by the way, and other grant making foundations contribute about three billion in total. The sector, interestingly enough, very few people know this: the income of the charity sector per year is seventy billion pounds. Whoa! <laughs> there are there are one hundred eighty seven thousand charities in UK. Many of them are very small, by the way, very small with incomes less than ten thousand, and many of them are very well known, such as Macmillan Trust, for example, the RSPC, the NSPCC, blah blah blah, etc. <laughs> But they all have something in common. And you and just thinking about the scandal at Oxfam, it just didn't hurt Oxfam, by the way, which, you know, the, the, the 3,000 direct debits cancelled in the first week, global ambassadors saying goodbye to them. It stained the whole sector. Yeah, of course. Everyone has to behave in the sector. Everyone has to be good, essentially, because they're trying to do good. They have to be good to do good. Uh, and the reputation of those charities is, is paramount to their ability to uh, – for trust, 
in the charity itself. And when people trust people or trust organizations, they're much more inclined to work with them. In the case of a charity, what they may want is for you to work with them as a volunteer or indeed to be a donor. So we're helping them. Uh, the root cause of all of this, by the way, and the thing that really matters uh, to a charity in terms of building reputation, which, which uh, in turn uh, builds their trust and confidence uh, among their supporters, is getting your governance right. So that's what we're doing, helping charities to get their governance right, to be able to demonstrate that they're well-run and well-managed. Yeah, and and how do you do that? Well, we do it online. We do it online. We have uh, built a questionnaire which trustees and senior leadership team members uh, fill in. This is very economical use of their time, 30 to 40 minutes. And with my tech background, there's a data analytics engine behind it that smashes all that stuff together. This is much more sophisticated than SurveyMonkey, by the way. Smashes <laughs> that smashes that all together and produces charts. As a trustee, I know myself, I was presented with reams of paper to read, which I was like, oh, it's so dull. I just don't. Yes. So, charts that are highly visual so you can see this information interpreted in a way you want to see it so you can think ah now i get it i now understand together with supporting data which gives you the context of what you're seeing in the chart and these things allow charities to see where their strengths and weaknesses are but also and this is very important and i've seen this around a charity board you know some people don't speak up they they just sit there quietly they could be very intelligent people, actually have views to express, but they may have a domineering chairperson or other dominant uh, people around the, the table. That does not support collective responsibility, which is something that's very important to the running of any board, and particularly a charity board. So one of the things we do by all of the responses to the questionnaire being anonymous, it means everybody can be totally authentic in their voice and being anonymous if they really do feel the charity is not being well run or, or, or could use some help in a certain area of its uh, work, then they can say so. And all of these things are reflected in the charts and data that's uh, then presented to everyone so they can have a dialogue, which isn't personal. It's a collective view and can therefore help with a constructive conversation as to how things can improve. Yeah. And, and this is vitally important, isn't it? I mean, I've been involved in the charity sector for well over a decade in different guises. And and I'm I'm still a volunteer today, and you're absolutely right. The, the governance, you know, those trustees have very very little knowledge about governance, and don't really understand it either. So there's there's two parts of it: is understanding where they're at with governance, but it's also the education as well. Absolutely. So we deal with both. If you invite somebody to read the 26 page document, which is the current charity code of governance published last year, endorsed and supported by the uh, charity commission, so it's dry. Mm. It's not very interesting. And then you can say, well, how do I put this to work? What does this mean to me as a trustee? What does it mean to my charity that I'm a trustee of? Or, and so what we do through the questionnaire, it saves you having to read the dull 26-page document. Sorry to call it dull. I'm sure I know a lot of work was put into it, but, you know, it is dull to read. <laughs> so we educate by by raising, you know, the, all of those aspects of uh, governance that need to be considered and then put some perspective on it. So we do it by saying, how well do you – think you you know you're doing this and what could we do better and everyone should have an idea of what they could do better because they're sitting around a table with an agenda and thinking about the charity's purpose and its aims and how they are why they exist and how they're trying to meet the needs of their beneficiaries everyone will have something on their mind as to what they could do better so we guide them through this so they both you know they get a result in terms of an output which they can discuss but also get educated along the way in things that they don't know yeah yeah Fantastic. And and so between those two businesses, that's taking up pretty much 80% of your time, is it? Yes, it is. The rest is taken up by golf, yoga, cycling, uh, and, generally <laughs> messing, and generally messing around. <laughs> because so in, in all the profiles and, and information that I see about you, Frank, it says you're very much kind of into the cloud. Um, <sighs> In, in that whole kind of cloud side of things. It, is that fair to say? Are you still involved oh, in that? Absolutely. So I'm Deputy Chair of the Cloud Industry Forum. I'm a Director of the Federation Against Software Theft, 
which is the superior organization to CIF, as we call it, Cloud Industry Forum, just published a book two weeks ago, which is thinking of building a Microsoft Cloud operating model, Ask the Smart Questions, with three other co-authors, which is a seminal piece of work. Uh, which was launched at um, Future Decoded, Microsoft's massively attended event in Excel London three weeks ago. Uh, I'm right. Yeah, I'm at centre stage on this, centre mm. stage. Mm. And, and I mean, you know, some years back when people were starting to talk about the cloud, and this is relevant for small businesses as well, I believe. And charities. And charities. Yeah, absolutely. Because... You know, we were all very fearful, weren't we? We weren't, oh, how's this all going to work, the cloud, you know? Is our data really going to be safe? And and then in the last, let's say, three to five years, we hear about so many of the kind of data hacks uh, that are taking place, you know, famous, well-known, reputable organisations are losing our data that we were very happy to put on the cloud and share openly, and then all of a sudden, all of our data is being stolen by hackers and stuff like that. And then one last thing to say, and then I'll ask the question. Um, I'm listening, uh, I'm enjoying listening to Audible, which of course is a cloud service listening to audiobooks. And there was a free series on there um, absolutely free on Audible called The Dark Web or Net or, yeah, it's a dark web. It's like 10 episodes audio program kind of podcasty thing where they are sharing with us, you know, what is happening on the dark web. And the thing, the last episode I listened to, I'm on kind of episode eight out of the 10, I think, they were talking about they, they now have some of these criminals organized gangs where literally they are making billions from hacking our data uh, and stealing our stuff. They, they, you can literally just go on and this guy did it like it was audio. So you couldn't see it. He literally went online on the dark web and bought himself a virus, downloaded a free virus ransomware that he could then use to use on other people's computers. And and then the last thing to say is we get at home, our work from home, we get on the home phone um, at least two or three calls a week now. And I suspect it's either India, Bangladesh or Pakistan or somewhere in the UK pretending. They, they all pretend that they are from Microsoft Reading. And I record the calls, right? I have long conversations with them for about 10 to 15, 20 minutes. And I record the call and see where they what they want to do with me. It is really worrying the cloud, Frank. How can we be more safe on the cloud? And and where is it all going? Because I'm nervous. Yeah, there's lots of issues out there. Barclays have a great program called Barclays Eagles. Uh, so some corporates are taking some responsibility here. It's interesting. Tim Berners Lee has left his position at MIT in America. To uh, he, he's distraught because he is the inventor, acclaimed. Uh, inventor of the internet he's distraught where the internet has gone so he wants to uh, reinvent the internet but the model of that reinvention is that we will be the custodian of our personal data and we will decide who we share it with that isn't the case today mm. now what that model i'm going to leave it to him he's much cleverer than i to figure out how that's going to be done but more and more people are getting more and more focused and anxious about how the personal data that we are is available online. We choose to put it there. Of course, we can stay offline, but that's a tough decision to make in this day and age. Yes. Um, and we see the scandals that are, are around Facebook, for example, have been well publicized. Google, the way they treat their data. I recently completed studies at Henley Business School for GDPR to improve my knowledge and understanding about data protection and data privacy and to advise organizations. I'm advising charities right now yeah, who are. Um, I'm very interested to know how they protect much of the sensitive data they have. Mm. Uh, it's becoming a big, big issue, and it ain't going to go away too soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so it will continue to be a big issue is what you're saying. The headline is it will continue to be an issue, We and we probably need to get more educated about it. You need to read and study. I mean, I've, I've read... Uh, uh, 
documents that have been written by engineers that have left Facebook and Google who talk candidly about how those organizations are using our data. And those are posted on my website, frankbennett.co.uk. You'll find them there. And they're quite frightening. You know, people don't know this stuff. So they think everything's okay because everybody else is on the internet. Surely, therefore, everything's okay. Not at all. You should educate yourself what the risks are. Obviously, Mm -hmm. Guard against those risks where you can, but just be mindful. How much data should you share and put online and make available to others? Yeah, good advice, and and it's it's a minefield for small businesses as well. You know, they a lot of people who are running small businesses. You know, as you said earlier, when you were talking about your son's kind of uh, fitness business. You know, a lot of these people, they just jump on the jump onto Facebook and they believe that is the way, the only way that they're going to be able to get in front of people. And of course, they are convinced to get into the advertising engines and everything else like that. So, yeah, it's 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 it is difficult. And even for myself, who's pretty clued up, you know, with technology, I always have been from very early on. It is still a minefield, even for me, you know, to figure it all out. So uh, God knows people that aren't kind of technology savvy. Okay, so so um, thank you for that. Um, really interesting how your your work and your life has transitioned into into this space, of, and how fortunate you were to stumble into the computer industry to get you to where you are today and and that you're still heavily involved in it is is fantastic to hear um where do do you see the future because what are your visions or views on ai for instance so interesting you say that i was going to mention that (laughs) so i'm a fellow of the rsa as well i joined two years ago i was invited to join two years ago i love the Uh, rsa yeah i love them they've inspired me a lot actually for what i do today so yeah good good good. so in the book that i mentioned earlier i think of uh, building a microsoft cloud operating model as the cloud it's now it's now everywhere it's pervasive the new technologies coming down the pipe uh, which are enabled by the cloud uh, artificial intelligence is one, and uh, robotics and process automation. Here's the thing. Why am I talking about them? Uh, they're very sexy technologies. They're going to make some people uber rich. They're also going to displace people out of work. I saw something the other day posted on LinkedIn. So there was uh, um, somebody forecast there could be up to 80 million jobs lost in the USA as a result of artificial intelligence by the year 2030. 80 million households without an income breadwinner. Mm. We have some big societal implications to think about as these new technologies come down the pipe. A lot of people will get uber rich. There'll be a lot, even masses of people more, who will find themselves with plenty of time to do nothing and no jobs to go looking for. Mm. Yeah. And, And some people are saying there's nothing to worry about, you know, because we're in the digital revolution on the planet and we had these challenges with agriculture and transport and various other things uh, and we managed to survive those we're going to survive this one too yeah we'll survive we'll we'll probably move to a universal basic income uh, and, and other measures will be taken i'm sure but we don't know the thing is we don't know i hear people contrast this to the industrial revolution which was you know kind of came to a sort of a close around 1820 1830 when there were 1 billion people in the world uh, we were dying before we were 45 sometimes younger we're now seven going towards 8 billion we're living to 80 90 current generations you know, the young today could live to 100 there's no you cannot make that comparison we don't know what we're heading into the house of Lords recently had a select committee inviting people around the world, uh, luminaries in this field, and companies to contribute to the AI debate. 
the document ran to 1600 pages if you've got time to read it <laughs> but this this is a serious subject which has major societal implications yeah. and we're rushing towards it this is something that satya nadell talks about in his book hit refresh you know we need to think about this technology is so ingrained in our society today we need to understand the societal implications that it's different now 20 years ago it was novelty we we're able to do things we weren't able to do now it's transforming transforming society how we work how we play how we learn we need to understand what this all means before we hit a situation where we've got a few uber rich in the world and a lot of people with no jobs to work and families to feed and is it something that you're you are staying involved with in in the discussion and the debate is it something that you're absolutely uh through the cloud industry forum is one way through the rsa is another way right got you got you well frank so we'll, we'll probably it's a good point to kind of conclude although i do want to ask just one more question and that is did i miss anything that you want to me that you would like to share with us well, the only other thing I'd share is only because I've invested. I said I became more scholarly in later life. So yes. in the last last seven years, I've invested about twenty thousand pounds of my own money in my professional development. Uh, two things: I studied the Financial Times non-executive director professional diploma. I operate at that level anyway, but I wanted to crystallise that in a recognised international qualification. There's mm -hmm. only about fifteen hundred of us in the world who have this qualification. And more recently, due to the focus on data protection and data privacy, I studied Henley at Henley Business School to get a qualification in GDPR. So both of those qualifications, when you mash them together, uh, make me very uh, able and competent to operate at a board level to be a, what they call a digital non-executive director. Every company today has some sort of business transformation agenda, digital uh, agenda, but often not people who are fully savvy as to the implementation of that. What's the strategy? What's, what's the plan? How do we get from where we are to a better place? So that's where I'm positioning myself alongside my charity work. By the way, that, that work I describe is also highly relevant to the charity sector as well. And so do you, is, is the plan then to have a number of non-executive positions? Yes, indeed. I mean, I have two today anyway, but they yes. are a pro bono positions, which I'm quite happy to do, by the way. I mean, this is an important part of my life. I don't need to earn from everything I do. Yes. But yes, absolutely. Uh, that was part of my life together with driving my own personal project. And the major one, as I've said, is Digiboard Limited. Mm. And then, so if you had a magic wand, what kind of companies would you like to be a non-executive director at or on on their boards? Yeah, these would be mid-sized companies. I don't think you know. I don't think I'm going to get on the board of Vodafone. I'm not networked at that level, unfortunately. I could perhaps be a board advisor to them, but probably it's going to be mid-sized companies who are doing well, who know that the digital revolution—it's you know—it's not a revolution anymore. It's just happening every day. And they're a bit shy in terms of experience in this area. Yeah. And they need that experience on their board to give them some guidance because it's a bit like governance. It's one of those subjects you want to talk about. But unless you have people who are competent around the table to talk about it, what's the point of talking about it? And, it, and what kind of turnover would those mid-sized companies be? Anywhere from £10 million upwards. And, and they could be charity or, or non-charity? There are some very large charities in yeah. the UK. Some of them are three, four £400 million pounds a year yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. But don't forget, trustees of charities cannot be paid. No. They can claim expenses, but they cannot be paid. I uh, know. Absolutely. Yeah. So non-exec director there is not, not going to be a paid role for you. So no, it's, a, it's, it's a trustee position. Anyway. Yeah, it's yeah. a trustee. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So where can people find you then digitally on the on the web? Let's share some links with them if you can. Yeah, sure. I've run my own website for a long time. Not terribly active with it at the moment. There's a huge archive of stuff I've written about. Uh, www.frankbennett.co.uk. Urge everyone who wants uh, an online presence to go and get their name, their domain name, and own it. I shall pass that on to my son, who's also Frank as well. <laughs> I pay. I pay. I think I pay two pound a year for the domain name, a little bit more for the hosting, but it gives you an online identity. So I say, if anyone wants to find me on Google, just Google Frank Bennett Cloud. You'll see me on the first page of Google's results alongside uh, an Australian jazz singer. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'm FB on Cloud uh, on Twitter. I'm reasonably productive there. Uh, and of course, uh, through my digital business, uh, the website there is thedigiboard, thedigiboard.co.uk. 
Okay, fantastic. And did, did you want to include your son's one? Yes, indeed. So my son, Frank, uh, www.workoutwithfrank.co.uk. If you're in the medical profession and listening and a GP who is uh, referring for exercise, uh, gpexerciseferral.com. He also has Twitter and LinkedIn, which you can find from those websites, just as I do. GPExerciseReferral.com. Yes, correct. Yes. That, I find that just really fascinating. Yeah, you're way ahead of the, the curve there. That sounds fantastic. Frank, thank you so much for appearing on the podcast. Really, so many things there to, to take away from it and to think about. Um, and this whole kind of digital and cloud area is only going to continue to grow. So I don't think you're going to retire anytime soon by the sounds of it. It doesn't look like it. No. <laughs> and, um, and hopefully we'll meet in person uh, one day. If you're ever up in kind of the West Midlands, Birmingham area or anything, give me a shout and I'll buy you some lunch. Uh, would love to see you in person as well. And thanks for, for coming on this and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, it's not quite the end because my recording was still going and I was having some further discussions with Frank. And when I listened to some of that recording after we'd really finished, I thought it was still really useful information that could be contained within the podcast. So yeah, have a listen to this conversation that was not at all rehearsed, but is really, really valuable. And in fact, a clip of it I included at the very front of this podcast. Enjoy. Give me a good life. But my life which pretty much changed after I left corporate life and I started to row my own boat and started to think more about what was important and what it mattered to me rather than what was somebody else's agenda. And that's taken me in different places as well. When I look at my peers who are work, still working in the computer industry that I hired many years ago, much more wealthy than me, living in big houses, but I didn't see them as being happy, particularly or fulfilled. That's interesting, isn't it? That's really, really interesting because what what are we all doing it for at the end of the day? Well, indeed. Um, what's your purpose in this life is the question not many people ask themselves. That's right. <laughs> and people don't know either. They haven't got a clue what their purpose is. And they're quite happy just kind of floating around without having any kind of sense of idea. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody has to be crystal clear on it, but some idea of of what? trajectory some idea of uh, direction of travel, I'd like to call it, probably. Oh. Indeed. Do you wake up in the morning thinking, yeah, I I've got a purpose. I know what I'm doing today. I know why I'm doing it, importantly, and I'm actually going to have fun doing it. Yeah, I pretty much. Yeah, I know. I know the direction of travel. You know, there's a bit of art of allowing as well. Yeah. Um, but the direction of travel is is. I've got more clarity of it in the last six months than I've ever had, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's very interesting. I'll tell you, I'll ask you this question, if I may. I mean, you're a creative person. That's quite clear to me. But my creativity in the recent years, I mean, the last seven or eight years, far exceeded anything in my previous life. And I think one of the reasons is, in my previous life, it was condition of absolutely having to earn money, but more importantly, serving others. So it's their agenda, not your agenda. And suddenly when it becomes your agenda, I found in my own experience, your creativity multiplies dramatically. I, I, you're 100% right. I never thought I actually was creative. The same for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never thought I was. And I've only discovered that in later years that actually I am creative. And I, I was listening to, um, what's his name? Uh, I've got it on the tip of my tongue. Um, I'm, I'm listening to a book on Audible, and I'm, I'm going to look it up really briefly as we're talking. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, people talk about creativity. As Ken Robinson, that's the one. Uh, Ken Robinson, he's a great speaker. He's, he's done some amazing TED Talks. And um, he's got a book called it's called the element mm -hmm. um and it's 
it's an audible and been listening to it on and off. And he talks about that whole point of creativity, you know, that everybody is creative, but people just don't realize that they are. So, and I don't know what that switch is that, that puts you in that creative mood, if you will, other than perhaps you take yourself out of you know, somebody else's agenda. And so for most people, most people's agenda is their employers. You go to work 45, 50 hours a week, you add on to that, your commute, you come home, there's family stuff to do, and all of a sudden you're drained. Yes, yes. <laughs> you're 100%, 100%. And um, I think you mentioned it earlier as well, which is um, about learning, you know, becoming a lifelong learner. So your education is one thing, you know, it's going to school and everything else. But I didn't start learning until I left school, you know, yeah. until I started to discover, actually, there's a bunch of stuff to learn that I don't know. Let's go and learn it and enjoy it. Yeah, and it's figuring out what interests you as well. A lot of people still don't know that. You know, what interests me? I don't know. You tell me. Mm. What do you mean, me tell you? You should know or at least be inquiring enough and to think about, well, what does interest me? And, of course, I find, you know, if you do have, uh, I mean, I hear some people say, I'm bored. So you're a boring person. Why are you bored? What are your interests? Oh, I don't know. Just think about it. Sit down. Go somewhere for quietly for a couple of hours and just think about what you know your life and what might interest you and why it might interest you and do something about it. A lot of people just get stuck. Yeah. yeah. Staying alive, UK. Share your story. 